we magnify your holy name, all for your glory. So it's good to see everybody again this morning. We, we are in this, started to study, actually started this process last Sunday. We're trying to do two different things on Sundays and Wednesdays. Wednesday night will be our Isaiah study. Um, I noticed this morning that those uh, copies of that ran out. Um, and so before I leave the building today, it's a it's a pretty long process. They're a pretty th it's a pretty thick book, so it takes it quite a while to print one. Um, so I'll set that in motion when I leave the building today, so there'll be more of those uh, Isaiah materials uh, available to you when you come back in the building this evening. That's Wednesday night, though. And then what I've been trying to do with this, this series is I adapted this from some things that Paul Rockwell had written years and years ago. Um, and uh, actually not that long ago, now that I think about it. It was more like early 2000s that he wrote some of that. Um, but anyway, uh, trying to adapt it a little bit. Basically, it's intended to give you a, a daily devotion to look at. And then, then when we come in on Sundays, we'll look at the last week's worth of devotions together uh, and talk about those things. In fact, when you leave today and you pick up this week's copy... I changed it up a little bit, how I did it. it it's, it's giving you the devotion, and then there'll be a discussion question at the end of each day. and that, So instead of a list of review kind of questions, there's going to be a discussion question listed at the end of each day that then when you come in on Sunday, you know what, we're going to, what the discussion's going to be about based on that text as we get in there. And that's kind of where we're at today. Um, I'm going to do the same thing. We're going to look at the main text that we're dealing with this morning, and then we're going to uh, explore each of those questions as, uh, as it relates to it. And so in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, and I'm going to focus on the main text that was given to you um, each day. I'm not going to explore all the others. There's just not time for that. And so, so I'm going to stay focused on just the first text that was given to you each day uh, to look at, and then we'll look at the question as it relates to it as well. And we are in the process of figuring out what, what we're going to replace this system with. Our network connectivity is shot. It's gone to the projector. I can't send anything from down below here anymore to it. Um, so it's going to be replaced eventually. Gary and I just got to get our heads together exactly what we're going to replace it with. Um, probably just a screen up there. Um, but, but anything hardwired still works, that's why the songs still work, but I can't, I can't send anything from the floor level anymore to the screen. Uh, and so, so anyway, that's an issue for another time. So, so nothing on the screen this morning, that's what I'm trying to say. You don't, so don't look up there, we'll look in our scriptures and look at our text. So the first text that he gave, we're still talking about this concept of being tempted or temptation uh, and things of that sort. And, and, and so in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 13, uh, there's, there in that text, what do we usually call that? Call that the Lord's Prayer or sometimes the, the model prayer, right? The model prayer. It was, it was derived from the moment where His disciples had witnessed Him doing what? Right, they had witnessed Him going out and praying and, and actually kind of leaving other things and, and going off and finding moments by himself. And so they ultimately come to the point where they say, Lord, what? Teach us how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray. And in part of that model that he gives to them here in Matthew chapter 6 record, he makes this statement in verse 13. He says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. All Men. And, and so there's some, some concepts I want us to appreciate about that. So the first thing he says is he wants them to stay out of what? Lead us not into temptation. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We sometimes talk about that way of escape, right? With every temptation, there is a way of escape. We looked at that last week. But wouldn't it be better just to stay out of the temptation to begin with? <laughs> Isn't it better to just stay away from the thing that could lead me to evil to begin with? That's what the model prayer is about. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep us away from the things that lead us into sinful choices and behaviors. And, and I think sometimes we forget that, that temptation is about is as much about me as it is the external environment or influence that is around me. 
What's luring me? What's enticing me? What's leading me to make choices and decisions that God would not desire for me? And so Jesus says, when you pray, pray for help to lead me away from these temptations and difficulties um, that I might not even have to address the potential of the evils uh, that, that come. Thoughts or questions about that? And that was really what the question as it relates to that was about. Anything that you thought of that I didn't mention? All right, so Luke 8 then was the next text that we're, we're given as it relates to this idea of temptation. And in this text, he's talking about the parable of the what? Sower. Parable of the sower. Okay, so the parable of the sower. And it, basically, the parable of the sower is to illustrate that what doesn't change in the parable of the sower? The word, the seed, right? The seed doesn't change. It's the same. It's the constant. What does change? The soils, right? Or, or in the human side of that, the heart uh, that receives it and how it is that it receives that. And he mentions some there in verse 13 that are on the rock. And when he describes those who are that seed that falls on the rock, he says, they're the ones when they hear, receive the word with joy, and they're... And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, fall away. So, some folks receive the message of the gospel with, with great joy and excitement about it. And there is an initial growth that happens, but because they're on rock, they can't grow any roots. Why, why are roots important? I'm no gardener, but... Alright, so that's where the nourishment is coming from. Keeps it steadfast, right? But that's, in, even in a gardening perspective, that's not easily done on rock. It can sprout up, right? There can be enough there to allow it to have an initial growth, but because it has no roots, the very t first time a what comes into the picture? Verse three, what, in the gardening standpoint, in the human standpoint, first time a temptation comes. When temptation comes, they quickly release what? believed in the joy that they once had and the excitement they initially had as it relates to the gospel. Think about in parallel to, to what Jesus said about the, the model prayer, lead us not into temptation. Why is that so important when you relate it to the parable of the sower? Yeah. If, 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 we, don't, if we don't have the time and, and, and effort that needs to take place to get the roots in place, then the first temptation that comes along might just very well knock me off of my belief and confidence in the scripture. And so, Lord, keep me away from that. <laughs> Lead me not into the temptation. Keep me away from the things and help me be honest about that. Help me be honest about the things that are actually luring me away from you and closer to the world. Help me be honest about the things that are leading me to paths that let the root uh, to fail to grow and the temptations leading me away uh, from the, from the cause of Christ. And, and we just asked that question in relationship. What happens when we don't develop those roots after hearing the word of God? Anything can what? Anything come and take it away. Anything can come and take it away without the roots. And, and that's, that's what Satan does, by the way. And uh, you've heard me tell you before, we get this image of Satan. and we th When I say the word Satan, if I asked you to draw me a picture, what would, what would he have? Horns and a what? A tail and a, and a pitchfork, <laughs> right? That's our imagery of Satan. No, no, that's okay, but, but no. It's not how he works. Right, let me tell you, right now, if there was a guy walking down Route 2 in red, horns, a tail, and a pitchfork, would you notice him? Yes, <laughs> yes. You'd notice that, Right? Satan works sometimes in unrecognizable and unnoticeable ways. Temptation doesn't walk up in a red suit with horns, a pitchfork, and a tail and say, I'm here to lead you away from Jesus. That's right. He'll come even as an angel of light sometimes to try to persuade us in ways uh, away. It, we've got to be honest about what temptation's really doing. Because Satan doesn't work in these blatant, obvious ways that we sometimes have this imagery of. And when we say Satan, 
will find where you're vulnerable and exploit it. I don't mean in some kind of visual way that we might represent that, but in the subtle ways that people can influence us, the subtle way the world influences us, those are the manners in which Satan is using temptation to slowly eradicate that message of the word and the gospel within us. Go ahead. Well, uh, this is a situation that God says that we have to I mean, as it relates to helping people grow roots, and, and I, I mean, there's accountability around us all the time sometimes that we ignore, you know what I mean, that we don't necessarily appreciate as much of as we should. But I do think we have a responsibility um, to, to aid and help each other grow the necessary roots to overcome uh, temptations and challenges. And, and, I, and I agree. I, I think that nobody likes confrontation, right? Nobody likes confrontation. And so, so sometimes we're very reluctant to get involved because we just don't want that, that odd moment. Um, but you're right. Sometimes we do need to intervene and encourage somebody and help somebody um, grow the roots necessary and, and find the path towards that. And, and we could, and, and there's a certain level of truth to the idea that ultimately who's responsible to grow those roots? We are, right? I, I'm respon- ultimately, I'm responsible. I get that part of it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, I think there's going to be a lot of people, and I'm trying to be cautious how I say this, but I want to say it clear enough so it's understood. I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people standing before judgment, and they're going to be pointing fingers at anybody and everybody they can as to why they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Right? They're going to say, well, the church failed me, or my family failed me, or my husband failed me, or my wife failed me, or my children did it. Right? They're going to have a long, and it's, it's not going to help me. Right? That's not going to help me in that moment. And yet, that still doesn't absolve me of my responsibility now to be of help. Um, just because they're personally accountable doesn't mean that I shouldn't accept my role in aiding them uh, in finding resolve and answer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, and I think, in some ways, he will. I think that's all of our, you know, it's part of our accountability uh, to one another. That that that, you know, sometimes we may have to ask for grace and forgiveness for those kinds of things. We call, we often call those sins of omission, right? We th- not not that we did something wrong, but we just something we should have done better at, and and we didn't. Good, feel good. That, he's pro at it, right? Satan, Satan, you know, he's he's really good at making things that are that are harmful for you look not harmful. Um, and it, the illustration you always hear about that's rat poison. So as I understand it, rat poison's ninety nine percent organic, fine, won't hurt you at all. It's the one percent that kills you, <laughs> right? And and sometimes that's the way Satan works. He throws he throws that one percent of harm inside a a bubble of other things that look perfectly fine, and he's good at it. You can change. Like, can a person change what kind of soil they are? I'd have to argue. Yes, I'd, I'd have to say that that for a while, Saul of Tarsus was, you know, a different kind of soil that he became when he finally opens up his heart and softens that heart and allows for that message to come through. So I, I don't think once rocky, always rocky. Uh, once thorny, always, you know, I don't think that that's the case. I think that, that those soils and, and mannerisms in which we embrace the gospel, and, and it's, it's, it's a scary proposition sometimes, right? Because on one side, we don't know whether there's tomorrow coming or not, right? We don't, we're not guaranteed, so we see this urgency. And, it be, and yet sometimes the only thing I know to pray for for certain people is time. You know, Lord, Lord can, can we have... A little more time because this person's just not in a place right now where their heart's ready to receive this and maybe with a little time that soil can change um, and be more receptive and yet then I come back and go but they need to do it now right it's hard it's hard but yes I think it, the soil can change and what may have to happen is we need to get rid of some of the rocks 
It's what you do if you till up your garden, right? You till it up and you find a bunch of rocks and it's hard to plant. You know, sometimes you've got to get rid of the rocks. The things that are going to hinder growth before you can plant. And I think sometimes in people's lives they've got to kind of purge what's hindering the process to get the soil right. Um, go ahead. Yeah, and, and if you don't want to do that, it, it, you know, there's a reason why my garden spot behind my house right now is grass covered right? <laughs> and the reason is I didn't want to till it and plant it. That's the truth. I didn't want to do it, and so I didn't. I just let it grow over this year. Um, it, that's the same way with spiritual things. People kind of have to want to engage the Savior and want to, to take root in the gospel um, for them to do what's necessary to get there. That's right. We can try to help and aid um, uh, and encourage um, but but can't forcibly change somebody's, you know, the soil in their mind and heart at that time. Absolutely. So then add that text. We I mentioned it briefly earlier, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13 was the third text, um, was uh, Tuesday's uh, text. But he said, There hath no temptation taken you but such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able uh, to bear it. And the question I asked in connection to that, if you flip towards the end of your sheets, is in what ways does God provide a way of escape from temptation? So how does he do that? We, we can say it, that with every temptation comes a way of escape, but how, in what manner? Okay, prayer can be helpful in that process. By study. Okay, by study. Um, reach out for help. Okay, develop the deep roots that are necessary to overcome the temptations when they come. That's right. Find a way to, to, to divert your attention away from those evil things that are, that are leading you there. Okay, you got to be watchful um, in this process. In, in what way did... Go ahead, Rain. I'm sorry. Uh, and a lot of help where you can show them how Satan does it. Yeah. And where they may be naive in this and show them you know, even like lessons about that. So you can understand the wiles and the ways of the crafting of Satan. Right. So you know to overcome that. Like always going to God's Word and looking to see what those problems are. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't always know, and, and here's something I want to think about what relates to that question, is, is what's God's role in all that? Because that's the context, right? He, he, said, he said, there is no temptation taking you is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, and with every temptation offers a way of escape. So what's, what, what's God doing in that process? Okay, he's providing the, the positive good things that lead us away from the evil. He's the one providing the comfort and, and strength when our faith is dedicated to him. He may be sending who to me? He may be the one sending the help. Right? I, I don't always know. Why, why, you know, you don't always know why you end up in a situation that you find yourself in sometimes. You don't know. Some, maybe the Lord's working. <laughs> Maybe he put you and that person you haven't seen for a while in the grocery store at the same moment. He didn't have to do that by miraculous means, by the way, either, did he? He didn't have to drag you out of your living room, pick you up by the head of your hair, and drop you into Walmart. You just went to Walmart. And oh, by the way, you bumped into somebody you've been meaning to speak to for a while. Maybe God's providing opportunities to bring encouragement to people. I mean... You just don't know, right? God's working to find ways to provide answer and help to temptation and how we overcome it. So, number one, I need to be open and honest about what my role might be in that. Back to things Bob was talking about earlier. And then also, I need to be receptive. God's trying to help me get out of this. And maybe it's that person that's coming to me saying, Hey, you need to rethink this. <laughs> this choice may not be what you want for your life. Um, maybe God's using that person to provide that way of escape. Um, we just need to be open to that kind of thing. He mentions in the first verse that <coughs> what is causing the whole time is Thank you. 
No, I, I, I think it's a general fact that he's trying. Not, he's not, I don't think he's trying to illustrate degrees. I think he's just trying to give us a statement of fact. There's no temptation that comes to any of us that isn't common. All, you know, we're all kind of experiencing, at least in the same basis, you know, where the temptations are coming. They're all common. And because they're all common, um, he won't give us anything that I can't overcome. And so I think maybe in some ways that's him trying to say, listen, don't, don't throw up your hands and say, well, there's just no way for me to overcome this temptation. I, I'm, I, I just can't resist it. No, every single one of them have a way to, to over, overcome. And we've just got to be willing to choose the path. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see degrees here, where if I get, you know, the greater the faith, the, the stronger the temptations that are going to be hurled at me. I see this more of a statement of fact than, than degrees. I think it's that we can know God is all powerful. There's nothing that's going to beat Him. So as long as we're continually trying to follow Him and find comfort in Him, we're always going to come out in the end. Like, yeah, yeah. If we're if we're if our confidences are in Him, He's the ultimate answer to temptation. Uh, and the overcoming of sin. And if we root ourselves in him, then that's the, the answer we're looking for. The next text was Galatians 6 and verse 9. This was Wednesday's reading. He said, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And question four that I asked in relationship to this was, in what ways can riches become a temptation? So, so how do riches become temptations? Okay, so maybe we are using, it's maybe we're using those riches to actually provide the very things that are leading me away from God and, and falling prey to the temptations. How else? Did I get out of order somehow? More things available. That's not what Galatians 6 9 says. Did I read it wrong? Or did I print it wrong? I read it right and printed it wrong. Is that right? Is that what I did? Okay, I printed it wrong. Somebody help me then. Thank you. So it was printed wrong and I didn't even catch it either. I just went off of what I printed and assumed it was right. There it is. You're right. Thank you, Kent. First Timothy 6. It's printed wrong on your sheets. First Timothy 6, verse 9. And I read it to you right, just gave you the wrong reference. Um, but anyway, back to, so, so, the, so what else can riches do to you? Okay, we can trust them more than God. All right, it can lead us to pride sometimes. Um, jealousies over what others have. You know, the temptation of riches isn't just about the fact, well, I'm rich and so it provides temptation. Sometimes just just the desire to be rich can be a temptation within itself. And that's... It becomes our pursuit and our constant and our focus. Um, and it becomes a temptation. It becomes our idol. Absolutely. Any other thoughts you may have had? Right text, wrong place. Right. Yeah, it, you're, you're right. It, it, it can, there's a reason why the Proverbs talk about give me neither poverty nor riches, <laughs> right? Lord, just put me somewhere in the contented stage because if I can stay there, I won't be lured by the riches of the world. I won't, I won't be lured into to lying or being dishonest or stealing because I'm in poverty. Just, just, give, me, just give me contentment. Uh, to be able to, to overcome those kinds of temptations that come along. James 1.12 was Thursday's text. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that, that uh, 
that love him. Uh, so, so when you think about the idea of, of overcoming and enduring, uh, I ask the question, what is received by those who endure the temptation and trials and remain faithful? Yeah, crown of life, uh, place in heaven, there's value in enduring the temptations of this life. Is that always easy to see in the immediate? No. What we see in the immediate is, is whatever it is that's enticing me and tempting me. Whatever we see in the moment, whatever's right in front of me, that tends to be the allure. And sometimes it's hard, right? It's hard to, to be willing to look past the moment and say, this isn't good for me right now, even though I may desire it. And there's something out here, if I'll overcome, that is far, far greater than, than whatever's in front of me. You know, it, it's, it can be illustrated a lot in terms of even, you, you think about, you know, you can have a dollar today or I can give you 20 two weeks from now. And you're sitting there trying to do the math, aren't you? Two weeks is 14, right? If I can wait four, 14 days, I can go from a dollar to 20. That's a pretty good investment, by the way. <laughs> so the, the point I'm trying to make is, though, but sometimes, and, and who normally would just drive the dollar right now? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. That's not where I'm heading, but, but, but uh, that's a different kind of scenario, not drawing. Children, <laughs> Right? Because children in, in their early stages and learning stages, all they see is what? what? What's right in front of them, right? And that's because they're children. That's the growth process that has to take place. But a lot of times we as adults kind of act like children. We want, you know, we want it right now. I want, I want whatever I want, and I want it right now. And we can't think beyond the moment enough to appreciate what's coming uh, tomorrow. There are adults that act that way as well. I think it is sometimes that, that we, we get the idea that, um, and, and it's, it's hard, right? Because that, that's a deeper question. So sometimes people might say, why did God do this to me? And, and that's a different kind of answer, right? Because God didn't do that to you. But why did God let this happen to me? Because that he did do, Right? He did let that happen. He didn't stop it. He didn't intervene. He, he did let that happen. And it's hard to understand sometimes how God lets the course of humanity continue, right? And it can become a, a hard trial to overcome when we're trying to rationalize in our minds, you know, I know there's an escape here and I know there's answer. And sometimes the only answer in the moment is the crown of life that's way out here in the future. And that's hard sometimes to keep our eyes focused on. Um, but, but you're right. It, it, God does let trials come. He does permit uh, human experience to happen to all of us. And we can't let those things distract us from the eye on the crown of life that, that is to come. And it's not always easy to overcome those kinds of temptations. With every temptation or trial comes that growth, comes that learning to trust more in God, and, yeah. and that is... Yeah, and, and I, I think, Amy, that you're right, that we forget sometimes with every success comes growth. And, and I think sometimes what we need to appreciate is, is, is every, every time we're willing to fight that battle, overcome that trial, get past and endure, it gives me strength for the next one because they're not stopping and I think that's the point we need to appreciate they're not they're not going away and, and until we're until our last breath is taken they're not going away um, the temptations that Satan puts and fills our minds with and until this body is is taking its last breath are not stopping 
But so with every successful accomplishment overcoming a trial, we, we gain strength and we gain a renewed faith and conviction. That's why it's important every step of the way uh, to try to have those victories uh, over temptation. It is hard sometimes, that's for sure. When Jesus had his disciples in the garden, that's Matthew 26, that was our next text. He talked about the temptation of the fact that their spirit might be what? Willing, but their, but their flesh is weak. Right? You, you, you may, what you may want to do, and sometimes the flesh is, is, is weak in relationship to, to getting done what is right. That's why, lead me not into temptation. Keep me away, Lord, from the things that you know are going to cause me to struggle, the things that I know that are going to cause me to struggle. Because I know my flesh is weak. I may, I may want to do what's right, but I don't always choose what is right. And that's how temptation works. It tries to get you in a combat, a competition sometimes, between your spirit um, and, uh, and your flesh. And that's a challenge that all of us have to overcome. Almost made it through all of them. It was one last one, but uh, Lord willing, uh, we can continue in this process through these studies. If you would bow your heads with me as we close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you again for the blessings of life. Strengthen us to overcome temptation and to appreciate the endurance of faith that comes with it. Uh, lead us and guide us in all that's right in your sight. And we pray all this through thy son's name. Amen. So.